The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Father, you say in your Word that you give ears to hear and you give eyes to see. There's a blessedness, Lord Jesus, that you ascribed to those types of eyes and to those types of ears. And so I pray Uh, In the power of the Spirit, our triune God will come down and give eyes to see and give ears to hear uh, your word. There's some wonderful things in your word, and if you don't move on us, we can't be affected by your word. We can't obey your word. We can't understand your word. We can't believe your word. We can't hope in your word. We can't bear fruit by the word of God. We can't become a new creation in Christ. Nothing can happen except that you move in the power of God through the word of God. And so we begin by asking you to please come and do that, Lord. Father, there's a, a, a lot of needs uh, here in this room. You know them all. I, uh, none of us can know all the needs. And so I just pray that you will come and be God in the center of this service, Lord, that you would uh, correct those who are in error, that you would convert those who are lost, that you would comfort those who are hurting, that you would encourage those who are discouraged, that you would heal those who are sick, that you would please lift up the downcast, that you would, that those are rejoicing in you, that you would strengthen that, God, through whatever it is uh, that, that people need, my prayer is through your word and the glory of Jesus Christ and by the power of the Spirit, you will create fresh praise and worship for your Son, Jesus Christ. And so now, Lord, I pray that you will come, overcome every heart that will hear this and create spiritual fruit, overcome my weaknesses and uh, Uh, ways that I would mess up the sermon, Lord, and allow your word to go out uh, with clarity and power. And I pray by the end we would not just understand the word of God in our mind, but feel in the inner man, strengthened by the power of the Spirit as Christ dwells in our heart through faith. So please do these things. Uh, We pray by your mercy and your grace you will hear us and accomplish this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, every year uh, at our church, I like to pause and do a New Year's sermon, and it pretty much just comes out of whatever God shows me the week before. Uh, One of my habits, though, at the end of the year that I would commend to you, there are some of my habits I would not commend to you, um, like playing video games too late sometimes, but one of my habits that I would commend to you is to keep a prayer journal all year. I don't know about you guys, but I, 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 I tend to get really distracted when I'm praying, and I start thinking about, man, how can the Nuggets lose to Phoenix? They're 10 and 33, you know, in the middle of my praying, uh, you know, stuff like that, and my mind just drift, and so God has shown me <clears throat> one thing that helps me stay focused and on key and thinking of God is I like to just pray and type out my prayers. And so it keeps me focused. And one of the benefits of that is when you keep a prayer journal, when you get to the end of the year, you could go back and look at it. And so one of my favorite customs at the end of the year is to just go back and look over the prayer journal and then pray the year back to God. Whether that means I'm praising him for something, thanking him for something, interceding even more intensely for things I prayed for last year, or reliving about, oh man, I'm sorry for that, Lord. Whatever it is, it is so good to go look back on the year of what God did, not, not, not just kind of generally, God, we know you're good, which is fine, but look back specifically in your life, how was God God? And to see it and to praise God for it and respond in prayer to him over there, it's wonderful. And so anyways, as I'm doing that every year, typically it's in that context that God gives me the New Year's sermon. So uh, Ken asked me to preach on Monday, and one of the uh, cool things about having people who attend Southside and attend uh, Gospel Community Church where I'm the pastor is that a lot of times I hear from them, Man, Ken's sermon was a lot like that uh, this morning. And Ken and I don't talk about what we're doing. We don't plan that out. It just works. But it's an encouragement to me that, man, God's spirit just kind of feels like sometimes it sees just puts similar things uh, on people's hearts. So I love that. So word on the street is that what I'm going to share with you uh, today, you kind of heard last week. 
I don't know because I didn't listen to the sermon, but if that's true, rather than saying, ah, we just heard this, you need to say, dang, I guess maybe I'm slow to hear. Maybe God wants me to hear it twice. <laughs> and so dig in and uh, um, uh, uh, enjoy uh, the word of God uh, with me. Uh, one of my strongly held beliefs in life is that it is critically important to prepare your mind for what you're going to face. Think about this. If you're going to have a picnic with one of your uh, best friends, and it's going to be at one of your favorite places, your mind is going to be prepared a certain way to encounter that experience. You're going to be thinking, oh, man, this is going to be a good time. You know, can't wait to see this person, see what's going on, whatever. You're expecting joy. You're expecting fellowship. You're expecting good food. You're expecting a good time. On the other hand, when you face a more daunting situation, in my life, I've had the privilege of being, I don't know, I, I don't count them, but probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 15 deathbeds. When you go to a situation like that, your mindset is not going to have the same, you're not anticipating though, the same mindset you are going to coffee. When I walk into those situations, you feel the weight of death. You feel the weight of eternity that for this particular individual is about to shift forever. And so you go in and you, you know that you are not sufficient to face an awesome setting like that. However, God is. And you go in the strength and confidence, not of you, but of the gospel and of God who works according to his word. And you're just bluttered as you're, you're hoping that the person who's dying, their faith will either, that it will be preserved by the power of God in their last moments. Or if those people do not know the Lord, that he will create faith through the preaching of the gospel. But you walk into that, man, you, your mindset is totally different than if you're going to get a pedicure. And so my point with that is it is extremely important to have the right outlook uh, on things, to, to think about what to expect and get your mind ready for it. And so going into a new year, I read some awful stuff on Facebook on New Year's Eve. And here is, by and large, what the world says on New Year's Eve. Oh, man, 2018. So many hard things in 2018. Oh, sorry, so long, 2018. I can't wait for 2019. Just going to be nothing but peace and prosperity and ease. Yes, 2019. And I'm sitting here thinking, I'm like, man, you guys are crazy. Did you pay any attention to 2018 or 2017 or 2016 or all the way back to 1940? Whoever had a year like that? Nobody has a year like that. In fact, the word of God, Jesus Christ himself, promises 2019 is not going to be free of trouble. John 16, in this world you will have trouble. And if you go into 2019 with the delusion that you're not going to have trouble, grounded in the worldly optimism and self-deception, you are going to be destroyed when 2019 brings hard things to you. In 2019, we're going to be tempted. We're going to sin. Some of us will get sick. Some of us will die. Some of us are going to encounter things we can't even anticipate. We're going to encounter many, many difficulties. We'll be persecuted all kinds of things are going to come our way in 2019 like that. So happy new year. <laughs> My biggest longing as a pastor is to see the people that I minister to conformed to Jesus Christ in spirit and truth. Ready to love him ready to worship him, ready to stand in faith when they get crushed, ready when they sin for the 10,000th time, but bring that fresh repentance to God to trust one more time the gospel sufficient, ready to seek him in the secret place to be shaped by the Spirit to grow in their love for Christ, to lead their families, to evangelize the law. I love that stuff. And so I know in order for you guys and the people that you minister to and the people that I minister, in order for that to happen, man, we got to be ready and sober-minded about what's coming. 
Trouble is coming in 2019. But it's okay. It's okay. Because Jesus Christ said, he has overcome the world, and in him we will have peace. And the word of God has a lot to say about our trouble. And so I'm convinced that this year, if we face our battles with a strong focus and alertness on the things that we're going to consider this morning, if, if, we, if we do that, I'm convinced we will gain breakthroughs in our walk and see real spiritual power in our life. Not the spiritual power to make you win the lottery, the spiritual power to make you treasure Jesus when you get smashed in 2019. That's real power. So... Our text this morning is going to come from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 13. Uh, So please go ahead and uh, (coughs) uh, turn there with me. Now, after laying out three chapters of wonderful Christ-centered doctrine, followed by two chapters on how to live our faith out in our daily walks, in our church, in our homes, and in the workplace, Paul turns his attention to the fact that all of these things will be assaulted by demonic forces in the cold reality of spiritual warfare, and he begins his teaching on this by calling believers to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. So let's look at verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. So the first observation here is that the foundational hope for all saints in this great war is that we are to stand in God's strength and in the power of his might. Now, what I love about this verse is that Paul has already told us back in Ephesians 1.19 that God exercises his immeasurable power towards those who believe. So he calls this power that we're to stand in not only the power of God, not only the strength of God's might, but he gives us this other description that this power is immeasurable. It cannot be measured. It's not power like Hurricane Katrina. Hurricane Katrina is measurable. It's not power like uh, a nuclear bomb. That is measurable. It is power that far exceeds all of those things. It is the power of God and is therefore immeasurable. <clears throat> now, in all of our spiritual battles, we do have a role to play. Yes, we do things. Yes, we open our Bibles, we, 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 we believe things, we make decisions, we make choices. We do do things. But the, the, the foundation of us fighting well in the battle is that we're to know that we do it in the strength and power of God. And when the strength and power of God is primarily what you're focused on in your battles and you are secondarily focused on how you fight, you will fight much better. But when you are primarily focused on, oh, I gotta get this ring, gotta get this ring, gotta get this ring, oh, you're just freaking out. And you're like, oh yeah, God. You're going to fight much worse. Now, I don't know about you guys, but when I'm in my spiritual battles, I never lose sight of God. I never have a, I, I don't, I'm never godless in my thinking about my spiritual battles. But what I do do is I make me way bigger than it should be and God way smaller than he should be. As soon as I do that, I don't know about you guys, but I'm filled with fear, I'm filled with anxiety, I'm filled with doubts until God, ah, you knucklehead, and he, 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 he helps me. So, We have a role to fight. I'm about to make that point really strong here in a few minutes. But know that we have that role under the umbrella and lordship of we are strong in the Lord and the power of his might. There are many great themes throughout the scripture. And they paint wonderful pictures of the glory of the Lord. And one of the themes of the Bible that I love is the amazing portrait of the power of God that's on full display in the Bible from start to finish. God's great work of creation, redemption, and the renewing of all things in Christ that are revealed in many wonderful ways through many glorious truths and by many amazing stories, they all show us that the unlimited power of God, it's the mightiest force in the universe. It will accomplish all of his purposes and nothing can stop it. In fact, nothing can even slow it down. 
In Genesis 3.15, we're told that Jesus Christ is the seed of the woman. And by his glorious power, he will crush the head of the serpent and undo Satan's work of introducing sin and death. In Genesis 6 through 7, it's by the power of God that the earth was flooded and evildoers were destroyed. And it's also by the power of God that Noah built the ark and was saved. Yes, Noah played a role in building the ark. However, he was supremely confident in what God had said about the flood. In Genesis 21, verse 1 and 2, it is by the power of God that God demonstrates his ability to bring life out of Sarah's dead womb and bring about the birth of Isaac. Yes, Sarah pushes uh, in labor. She probably screamed. But it was by the power of God that this child came to existence. In Exodus chapter 3 through 4, God calls Moses to be a deliverer for his people who were enslaved in Egypt. And when this happened, Moses is full of self-doubt, and he's like, oh, Lord, I can't speak. You know, send somebody else. And there is, listen, there's not one time in Exodus 3 or 4 where God looks at him and says, oh, man, Moses, what are you talking about? You're so awesome. Uh, you're so strong. You can do it, Moses. You, you're, you're really a great speaker. Don't think so low. He doesn't say that. He says, I'm with your mouth. I make you talk. I will be with you. They start performing miracles, a leprous hand and sticks and snakes and all kinds of crazy. Why? To draw Moses' attention and hope and trust into the power of God to be with him to accomplish all that Moses is going to do. Yes, Moses lifts the staff. Yes, he talks to Pharaoh. Yes, he prays. Yes, he does certain things. But he does it in the confidence that it is the power of God with him and working through him. In 1 Samuel 17, David put no hope and confidence in weapons when he faced Goliath. Instead, he knew God was with him and that it was by the power of God that he would defeat his enemy, even though David himself had to step in and actually fight. David said to Goliath in 1 Samuel 17, 47, he says, The Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's. And he will give you into our hand. That's the mindset David stepped up to face Goliath with. Yes, he took stones, five of them. Why did he take five? I don't know, because he took five. He takes five stones to take on Goliath. Yes, he puts him in his little sling. Yes, he throws the sling. But he's not one time. We don't read about some like strategic game plan. Ooh, okay. Hey, Saul, what do you think I should do? Oh, when he goes, when he like dips to the right, fake it and then throw it back to the There's none of that stuff. It is, he's sitting there and he was like, man, who's this uncircumcised Philistine who mocks the armies of the living God? It is by the power of God I'm going to step in. I'm weak. I'm nothing. But God is everything. And I will step in by the power of God. I will not be afraid. And I will take down my enemies. He will deliver you into my hands. And that's exactly what happens. Yes, David does something. But he does it in a brokenness and in a weakness that is dependent upon the power of God, not him. When the Assyrian military leader Sennacherib was mocking Israel and threatened to obliterate them, this is, you can read about this, Isaiah 36 to 39. Kiah is looking out, and he's scared. And he turns to prayer and fasting for deliverance. And it's the angel of the Lord who went into the camp of the Assyrians, and in one night he killed 185,000 of them by the power of God, Isaiah 37, 36. Over and over and over again, we see God's power displayed wonderfully in the word of God. And it is this power that we are called to be strong in. It didn't stop in the Old Testament. It didn't stop with the apostles. His power continues today. We are called to be strong in that power. Now, I've known people, hopefully you're not one of them. If you are, I love you, and I'm going to call you to repent right now. <clears throat> I've known people who, hearing the truth that God works and fights for his people, they then take those truths, and they become totally lazy and apathetic about pursuing God. 
They refuse to fight the good fight, and they wrongly conclude that any effort in the Christian life on their part, oh, that's just legalism or striving in the flesh. That isn't at all what this teaching is designed to produce in us. Just as it's not, we're not supposed to have this horrible fretting where we make ourselves more important than we really are, we're also not to be lazy sluggards that do nothing because of this. That kind of application to this truth that, that we're to be strong in, in God's power as we hope in him to fight for us, that type of an application that uh, I, just, I, just, just, I, don't, I don't have any pursuit of God, that's a demonic application, it'll destroy you, and it's totally foolish. Suppose you have a loved one, and the loved one is terminally ill, and you can't buy their healing. You, you can't heal them yourself. You've been to countless doctors. Nobody can heal them. And then all of a sudden, there's this person who says, hey, I'm 20 minutes east of you. Come over here for free. I will completely heal your loved one by my power. Just got to come over here and come to me and I will heal that. I will heal your loved one. And you say, oh, no, nope, no, nope, I'm just waiting on your power. I'm going to just stay home. It's like, dude, I'm 20 minutes away, just, just come, and I'm going to do it. Nope, nope, I'm going to wait on you. Oh, man, I wait on you. You know what's going to happen if you apply it that, if you apply that promise that way? Your loved one will die. Knowing that God's power is at work in us, knowing that the battle belongs to the Lord, knowing that he supplies it to us as we fight, that shouldn't make you lazy. That should make you diligent. It's like, yeah, let's do this. How can I lay hold of that? How can I tap into this? How can I walk in this? I want more of that. That's what it should, it should just make you understand. Man, okay, so what do we do? How do I be strong in the Lord? It should make you want to know answers to that question, not be lazy and apathetic and, and sit there and, and, and not pursue God. <clears throat> so it's very obvious that we're to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. We rely on his power, his presence, and his spirit to work in us and through us and around us so that we can have the victory. So knowing these things, we don't fret over our role and we also do not passively sit down unarmed and lazy. Instead, by faith in the wonderful reality that God fights for his people, we get up and engage the battle relying on the strength of God. Where do I get that? in the word. I get that from the connection I see between verse 10 and 11. Let's read it. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. So there's the call to be strong in God. Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God so that you'll be able to stand against the scheme of the, of the devils. So you see that? Be strong in God, put on the armor of God. That is connected right there in the text. <clears throat> our putting on of God's armor is the way in which the power of God and the strength of his might is given to us. And without us putting on God's armor, we're going to lose our spiritual battles. God, the champion of our spiritual battle, he enlists us into his war and he works his power and might through us by providing us his armor to us so that we can put it on. And it's the armor that enables us to live in the power and might of God. And this power, it's a spiritual power. It's a supernatural power. It's a power that Ephesians 1.20 tells us raised Jesus from the dead and seated him in the heavenly places. That is the power that, that we're to be strong in and we pursue it through putting on the armor of God. Yes, it's God's power. Yes, we tap into it by grace through faith. Yes, it's ultimately God who gets the victory and the glory, but we very much do put the armor on to access that power. And in a minute, I'm going to give you three practical ways to do that. Um, but before I do that, I want to draw out one last thing. Now, the stated reason in our text why we need the armor of God is connected to who we're fighting against. Let's look at this again. Tells us in verse 10, be strong in the Lord in the strength of his might. Then it says, put on the whole armor of God 
that you might be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. There's a real Satan. He has real forces. They are organized. They are crafty. They have spiritual power. They know the Bible. They know how to deceive. They are ancient and they are deadly. And with God's permission, these demonic forces can cause illness. They can cause calamity. They can stir people against us. And they can even kill us. Job 1 and 2. We also know from 1 Timothy 4, verse 1 through 5, that through human false teachers, demons sow false doctrine, sin, and division in the church. That it's called the doctrine of demons. And to make things even more wonderful, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, tells us that by nature, you and me are just all too willing to serve them. By nature, we follow teaching that doesn't call us to be saved by a gospel that we don't participate in, by, uh, 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 don't participate in by way of saving ourselves. By nature, we rebel against what God says is right and wrong. By nature, we crave sin. By nature, we don't crave God's glory. We crave vain glory. Those, that's all serving the devil. So by, by nature, we serve him. And there's all these forces around us that are so powerful. They're like, hey, serve me, the devil's saying. And we say, sure thing. There's a huge power we're up against. And without the power of God, without the armor of God, we have absolutely no chance against Satan and his schemes, uh, his his spiritual forces, and his false doctrines. It's the seed of the woman, Jesus Christ. He's the one who crushes the head of the serpent and defeats his offspring. And so if we're to have any hope in being victorious in the battle against these enemies, we need to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might so we can stand in the evil day because we cannot defeat them on our own. So I said just a moment ago that we're going to look at three practical ways about how to put the armor of God on. So uh, let's do that uh, now. Um, The first way that we as Christians access the power of God is through the word of God. In the first creation, it is the word of God alone that creates all things and brings them into existence. In Romans 10, 17, we hear faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. And so the word of Christ creates faith. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, we hear if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. How do you get in Christ? Through faith in the word of his gospel. And so by the word of the gospel, we are made new creatures. So in the first creation and in the new creation, it is the word of God that brings things into being by its power. In addition to this, just staying in Ephesians 6, we can see that all of the pieces of the armor of God described in verses 14 through 18, they are dependent upon the word of God. I'm not going to go through all the pieces of the armor I'll give you some examples. Verse 14 talks about the belt of truth that we're to put on as the armor of God. Okay, what's the truth? Jesus Jesus told us, John 17, 17. Father, sanctify them by, by your truth. Father, your word is truth. You can't put the belt of truth on if you don't know the word of truth. Uh, The shield of faith, when we are being attacked and these fiery darts of the devil are coming at us, we're called to fight that back with faith. Faith in what? Faith in rightly understood truths from the word of God. You can go ahead and work through all the other pieces of the armor, but I will argue that every single one of them cannot be appropriated by, by you apart from the word of God. So right here, staying in our context where we're called to be strong in the strength of the Lord by putting on the armor of God, we see all the pieces of the armor of God and they are totally dependent upon the word of God. In fact, the sword of the spirit, what's it explicitly called 
in the armor. It's called the word of God. And so if we're ever going to stand in the power of the Lord and in the strength of his might, we must know the word of God or that power will not be accessible to us. Because do you realize how much God does by his word? It, it is awesome. He creates stuff. He sustains stuff. He, sancti whoop, he sanctifies believers. He abides in us. Jesus Christ abides in us through his word. He saves sinners. It's amazing what happens uh, in the power of God by the word of God. It is such a privilege to hold this book up and to read it and to understand it. God works great things through God's word. <coughs> However, listen to everything I'm about to say. It may sound a little bit jarring, especially like what I just said. The word of God alone is not enough for us to stand in the power of God. It's essential. You can't stand in the power of God without it. But it's not enough on its own. If we would truly have God's power operative in our lives, we need to be diligent also in prayer. Where do I get that? Well, I, I get that from multiple places, but just sticking to Ephesians 6, you can see in the last statement of the description of the armor of God, prayer pop out in verse 18. <clears throat> right after telling us about the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, verse 17, Paul says that we're to also be praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. This is part of being strong in the Lord. Remember, be strong in the Lord, verse 10. That's what started this whole thing. So th this is part of the, the, the picture here is uh, praying in the Spirit. If we want spiritual power, we see we must pray at all times in the Spirit. And this isn't some just lame praying that has no shape or guidance. It's not, dear God, bless the whole world, amen. It's not that sort of thing. This is praying in the Spirit. It is a Spirit-led praying, a Spirit-filled praying, a Spirit-empowered praying, and the result of such praying is that it will bring about spiritual victories in this battle as we pray in the Spirit and thereby receive strength from God. So that begs a question, doesn't it? What's praying in the Spirit? Well, we can spend a long time on this, but briefly, I'm going to tell you how I would define it. Then I'm going to give you an example of it that I see in Ephesians 3. And hopefully we'll uh, learn some good stuff from that. Here's how I would def define it. It is, it is praying in a manner that your heart and mind are filled with the word of God in such a way that your burdens and your yearnings and your deepest desires and your sadnesses and your joys and what you long to see God do with all of your heart, it's praying in a way that all of that stuff is in tune with the will of the Spirit and by prayer you call upon his power to produce these things. In your praying, Regardless of your style of praying, it's not style of praying. It's not whoever prays the loudest is praying in the Spirit or whoever prays the most eloquently. In your praying, regardless of your style, you're moved by the Word to pray according to the Spirit. And as you do so, there is a communion with the Holy Spirit and a spiritual power that moves in your inner being so that you are strengthened in your inner man to walk in the power of God. That's a lot of words. In short, I believe praying in the Spirit is praying that's deeply shaped by the Word of God, has a profound communion with the Spirit, resulting in the supply of true spiritual power to the believer. There's a short one. Shaped by the word in your praying, here comes the spirit and it gives you a sweet communion with him and a, and a, a profound power in your walk. And so I told you that I see an example of this in the book of Ephesians. So please turn to Ephesians 3, verse 14 through 19. <clears throat> we'll start in verses 14 and 15. Paul says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. So, 
Here's Paul bowing his knee. He's praying. And I believe it's safe to conclude Paul is praying in the Spirit. He's doing exactly what he tells the Ephesian church to do in chapter 6, verse 18. Let's keep going. Verse 16 and 17. So here, here's what he's praying, verse 16, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Let's stop there. All right, now think about what we just read. He's praying we'll be strengthened with power in the inner being. And think about Ephesians 6.10. What did it call us to be strong in? To be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now here's a prayer from Paul. Be strengthened uh, by the Lord. He's asking that. He's praying for that. And he is praying that we will be strengthened with power through the Spirit as he prays in the Spirit for believers. So Right there, I think, we see the link between being strong in the Lord and praying with spiritual power. Now, this type of praying, it brings spiritual strength to our inner being. That's what it said in the text there. We just read it. It brings a spiritual strength to our inner being in such a profound way that Christ dwells in our hearts through faith. Look at this. Look at this connection. Verse 16 and 17. He's praying that according to the riches of God's glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit. So there's that power and strength. In your inner being, now look, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Do you see the power there? This is a prayer that divine strength and power will come to the inner man through the spirit and that by faith, the one who crushes the serpent's head namely Jesus, he will be making his home in our hearts in a profoundly supernatural way. Without this kind of praying, we cannot lay hold of this type of spiritual power. Through praying in the Spirit, there's a real Holy Spirit-produced strength and power in you, so much so that it facilitates a special communion with Jesus in your heart. This doesn't mean Jesus goes in and out of our heart. He abides with us. He's with us always. He says that in Matthew 28, 20. But you don't have to be a Christian for more than a week to know. There are times you walk with Christ when his presence is like, yeah, that is awesome. And there are times where it feels like, where are you? He's still with you. But we very much can experience fellowship with Christ in different ways and to higher degrees. Why wouldn't you want more of it? You can have it. And how does it come? It doesn't just come through the Bible. It's not apart from the Bible. It comes in the Bible and by the truth of the Bible. But it also comes by the power of the Spirit opening your eyes and strengthening you in the inner man, bringing a fresh spiritual power through the Word, creating a stronger communion with Jesus Christ, who is the one who crushes Satan. That is, that's good stuff. Now, before diving into this text, I argued that praying in the Spirit was connected to a right understanding of the Word of God. And then I said, this prayer in Ephesians is a good example of praying in the Spirit. So, where is the, is the connection to the Word of God in this prayer? I think we can see it first, uh, beginning in verse 17. It says, Christ dwells in our hearts through faith. We get faith in what? Faith in what the Word of God says about our glorious Christ. You open the Word of God, you see He's active in creation. Begin, the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God, and everything was made through Him. You're like, whoa, that is awesome. And then you're praying over these truths, and they're becoming alive to you. The, the Word that says He's a merciful and sympathetic high priest, and we can come to Him with confidence to give His grace and to give His mercy to help in a time of need because He died for our sins. You take in those truths, you have faith in those truths, and then you're praying in the Spirit's strength strengthening you with that, and Christ is communing with you in a special way. You got faith in that. 
Faith in Hebrews 7.25, because he lives forever, he, he always lives to make intercession for us, and he saves us to the uttermost. He's interceding for you now. He will keep you following Christ, and he saves you to the uttermost. And so when you take truths about Christ, and you're thinking about them, and you're praying over them, and you're communing with the Spirit, this power is created, and the fellowship of Christ comes in a sweet way. There's the word of God right there. Faith in Christ. <clears throat> now, the second place I see in Ephesians 3 here uh, that praying in the Spirit in this text has a connection to the Word of God is I see it in the last part of verse 17 going all the way through verse 19. So let's, let's read there. Uh, verse 17, Paul says, So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, so that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have what? Strength. There's that word again. You may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what it is a breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Where do we learn about what it means to be grounded in the love of Christ? You want to learn that from the world? They got a very different definition of what the love of Christ is than the word of God has. We learn about the love of Christ that Paul's praying for us to be grounded and he's praying for us to understand in a supernatural way. We learn about it as it's revealed in the word of God. In fact, verses 18 and 19, Paul asks for strength. Strength for us to what? To comprehend and to know the love of Christ. Where's the starting point for that? The starting point is what the word of God reveals about the, lo the, the love of Christ. You have to get that truth in front of you. And you pray for strength to comprehend it in your inner man and to know it. And so when we take in the word of God by faith, and then when the spirit is at work, he takes the word of God, he fills us with his strength and power, and Christ dwells in our heart in a wonderful way. And from the deepest parts of our inner man, we know the love of Christ in such a way that our inner man gains strength. Do you know the love of Christ right now? Do you know it in your mind? I mean, do you feel loved? Man, he loves you. He loves you. Some of you need to hear that. I'm a basketball coach, and sometimes my kids, well, not my personal kids, they would, of course, never do this, but the kids who play for me turn it over a bunch of times. And... and uh, you have bad shooting form, bad shooting form, and, 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 and you get frustrated we're trying to, trying to correct it. Sometimes I need to stop and just tell them, like, bro, I love you. He's like, oh. There was a sweet little boy yesterday who was playing defense by reaching with his hands and not moving his feet. Drives me nuts. Right, right Wayne? Uh, <laughs> and, and so anyways, I take this kid out, and he's, he's all upset. I put my arm around. I was like, buddy, you start moving those feet. You're going to be the best defender in this league. He goes like this, and okay, and I was like, I'm going to put you right back in in a few minutes. He's like, okay, and I put him back in, and he starts moving his feet. I mean, this kid plays some D. I mean, he looked like Draymond Green out there. And, I was like, and my point is, he was making a bunch of mistakes, and he needed to be reaffirmed that he's loved. And some of you, you made a bunch of mistakes. You've sinned. And you need to be reaffirmed that Christ loves you. He died for you. He died. He knew those sins were coming. He died for you. You're worse than you think you are, and he still loves you. And so here's Christ saying, I love you, bro, or sweetheart, or whatever you are. He's saying that through the gospel. He paid for your sins, and he's with us to change us. And so Paul is praying for us to know this and to be strengthened in the inner man. And then at the end of Ephesians 3, going even one more glorious step further, right after telling us he prays that we will comprehend and know the love of Christ, which obviously no doubt is connected to the word, he then says that this love surpasses the very knowledge he prayed we would have. This doesn't mean that we know the love of Christ apart from knowledge. That would contradict what he just prayed when he asked that we could know and comprehend the love of Christ. I believe it means that when the Spirit moves in you like this, the knowing of the love of God is so strong and so amazing that it goes beyond what we can know and comprehend. It starts with what we know and comprehend. It's not apart from that. It enters in through that, and then it goes beyond that. 
So when you pray like this, by the word of God, the spirit moving to strengthen you according to the word, I think that's what he means by praying in the spirit. Maybe there's more to it than that, but I think it's at least that. I think Ephesians 3, 14 through 19 is an example of Paul doing Ephesians 6, 18 for the Ephesian church. And it instructs us about how to pray in the spirit. And so that is your second practical way to tap into the power of God. First one, know the word of God. Second one, prayer according to the spirit. I still got some time. Um, the third practical way to tap into the power of God that I see in the book of Ephesians is that we are to seek to lay hold of it through the church. Now we've seen already the need for prayer in the word of God, but there is also the great need to enlist the help, the fellowship, and the co-labor of our fellow soldiers who are also soldiers in God's great army. We're not the only soldiers. Sometimes we get so lost in our battles, we think we're the only ones in the army. This is not true. There's a great, massive army of believers that God has saved. And so if we are to be strong in the Lord, as Ephesians 6.10 tells us to, we need the church. Where do I get that from the word of God? That sounds nice. Of course, coming from a pastor, what else is a pastor going to say? Where do I get that from the word of God? I get it from Ephesians 6.18. Ephesians 6.18 has already talked about praying in the Spirit with all prayer and supplications. Then it makes a clear statement about the church. It says, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. So there it is. As we pray in the Spirit, we're to pray all prayer with supplications, not only for ourselves, but for all the saints. Where do you get to know saints? In the church. Saints make up the church. Saints are the church. We pray in the Spirit, yes, about our own battles, but we also pray for the battles of our beloved brothers and sisters in the faith. And we can't be alert for other people or have them be alert for us, which is what we're supposed to do according to verse 18. We can't be alert in prayer rightly if we do not have meaningful involvement with the church. We need the prayers and encouragements of the saints for ourselves and the saints need it from us and this is explicitly stated in Ephesians 6.18. <clears throat> When we're beat down, when we're discouraged, when we've lost a lot of battles, when we're struggling, sometimes we just need the saints. The saints who are also filled with the word, who also pray in the spirit, we need them to come alongside us and help us through prayer and the word of God. Sometimes we're so discouraged and we're under such demonic attack in our twisted thinking we need saints to come lift the shield of faith for us. Sometimes we need faith, or I'm sorry, we need saints to come and we're just buried in guilt and condemnation. We need to come, dude, you lost your helmet. Let me put that helmet of salvation back on for you. Sometimes we're just so maybe depressed or confused or fearful or anxious or angry or whatever. We need someone to come who will wield the sword of the Spirit in our battles and help us. Kind of like Yoda showing up in the middle, like, whoa, 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 whoa. And we're like, yeah. It's a, sometimes we need that. But listen, if you want to be strong in the Lord, because 2019 is coming for you. And if you want to be strong in the Lord, you better have meaningful involvement in the church. That means meaningful relationships with Christians. It does not mean attending a service. It doesn't mean listening to your favorite celebrity John preacher on the internet. I'm not saying those things are bad. They're good. The service is good. Uh, listening to other people is good. But it means those things aren't the church. John MacArthur is not the church for you. This is the church. And you must have meaningful 
rich involvement with the saints if you're to gain power from them. How foolish would it be for one man, even if he's the most powerful Navy SEAL, to invade China by himself? So also, he is a great fool who seeks to live out his faith on his own. We need each other. Satan is very aware of this. And so he will do everything he can to keep us from each other. He'll do everything he can to tear us apart. He'll do everything he can to twist our thinking uh, into convincing ourselves that we don't need the saints to help us in our battles or that we can do no good in helping others. He will sow evil suspicions in your mind towards people. He will do everything he can to keep you out of this because he does not want you strong in the Lord. Nobody is sufficient to fight our own battles. And Ephesians 4.16 says that it is the body of Christ that builds the body of Christ up in love. And so to pull yourself away from that is to deliberately, seriously weaken yourself. And here we see in our text on spiritual warfare, we're dependent upon the saints in prayer. In fact, I'm not going to read it, but Paul ends this section in verses 19 and 20 of Ephesians 6 by presenting his own prayer request to the church. So we have to love each other. We have to help each other. We have to maintain our unity. We have to enter into each other's battles. We have to pray for each other. We have to lift the word of God to each other. We have to fight for each other, not with each other. We have to stay joined together or we will be crushed. I mean, even the world gets this. I mean, how's like, like, like every Avengers movie got like the same storyline? It's like, here's all the power heroes, and then, the, you know, they get all egotistical and everything. They start fighting with each other, and they're weakened, and then, you know, things go bad, and they got to come together and unite, and then they win. I mean, that's how, I don't know how Endgame is going to go, um, but that's how it's going to go uh, in April. That's how they always go. So sorry I spoiled it for you, but uh, that's how it's going to go. Because even the world knows this. Together, unified in Christ, standing on the word of God, repenting of our sins, forgiving each other, bearing with each other, helping each other, praying for each other, serving each other, loving each other, we will access the strength of the Lord in new ways as we are stronger together. And it's not easy. I'm sure all of you have your war stories of being hurt in the church. It's not easy. It's a crucified path of suffering. How did it go for Jesus when he came for the church? They didn't believe him. They didn't receive his word. Even the ones that love him, they're still not getting with him. There are Peter's arguing with him you know, under the influence of the devil. Uh, they all abandoned him at the end, and Jesus didn't pout and take his ball and go home. He went to the cross and died and rose again and restored him. And Peter, do you love me three times? He stayed in the game. It's a hard path. We're not called to an easy path. We're called to a hard path. It's a crucified path. It's a suffering path. Jesus said, a servant's not above his master. If they crucified me, they called me Beelzebub and do the same stuff to you. It's going to happen. It's bloody. It's hard. It's suffering. It even kills some of us. It's a path of the cross. But it's also the path of life, the path of God's love, the path of forgiveness of sins, the path of fellowship with God, the path of real spiritual power, the path of resurrection from the dead, and it ends with the crown of life. It's not easy. That's why it's called war. So what are you going to face this year specifically? I don't know. But I know that if we are primarily focused on the glorious truth that God's with us, that he's going to fight for us, that he's going to dispense his might towards us in our battles as we live in his word, as we pray in the spirit, and as we have intimate connection to the body of Christ that we link arms together with, we have no reason to fear, even if you die this year. 
He is the victor. And the more confident we are that God is with us, the more we understand the word of God, the more we pray in the spirit and are together, we will see uh, greater faithfulness in our fighting, greater real spiritual power in our walks. But all the hope has got to be rooted in God. This spiritual power, it's not some puffed up thing. It's like, man, I'm strong in God. I'm super cool. It's, it's not that kind of thing. It's a spiritual power that's like, man, I'm so broken. I'm so vile. I'm so sinful. I'm so tired of my same sins again and, and struggling. This fight is so difficult. I can't do it. But God can, and he, he helps me. It's that sort of strength. Sort of strength of, I don't know what, I'm so confused. I have no idea what to do in this situation. No clue. When I think about it, the confusion of it crushes me to despair. But in the weakness of faith, I know the word of God says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. And in a weakness, there's a power to keep moving forward in God. This isn't some hot, hot air, puffed up, uh, you know, I'm the man kind of thing. It is a broken, I have been beat down by the world. But I take heart because Christ has overcome the world. In my weakness, in my brokenness, when I feel like I can't move one more inch, God is so faithful to bring a fresh text to strengthen me. God is so faithful to meet me in prayer when I feel like I can't even talk and lift me. God is so faithful to bring a dear friend when you feel like you're just done and they strengthen you and you keep going. Who gets glory from that? God. Not us and how strong and awesome we are. It's his strength. His strength. You want to see conversions? What did the angel tell Joseph? You will call his name Jesus. He will save his people from their sins. Are you going to face tough battles of sanctification? 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, and he will surely do it. Tell that to your sins. You want to see your, your church grow in a way that's pleasing to God? Jesus said in Matthew 16, I will build my church. You fearful you might turn away from God? Ezekiel 36, 27, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You will not chuck the faith if you are a believer. God's spirit won't let you. You're worried you're not going to have enough strength to do what God calls you to do next year? Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Are you worried that your limitations and weaknesses will make you useless? Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10, these thorns, they humble us and they weaken us so that the power of God can rest on us and we learn the sufficiency of his grace. These are some ways that by the word and in prayer and through the body, you lay hold of the power of God and walk in a manner worthy of the gospel. And so, saints, if Christ died for our sins, to Colossians 1, 13 and 14 us, which is transferring us out of the domain of darkness, Satan's domain, and into the kingdom of his son, whom he loves and whom we have redemption of his, uh, whom we have redemption of the forgiveness of sins. It's, if Christ did that for us, the biggest battle, you think he's not gonna fight your other battles that you face? He's going to. And if you're not a believer today, I'm going to tell you right now, like you, 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 believers, we, we are in the battle from a position of victory. We are in a battle from a position of, we know how this ends. Jesus Christ saves us and he renews all things and we're with him forever. Yes, sir. If you are an unbeliever, we know how that battle ends too. You're in a position of defeat. It is over. There is no question how it will end for you. If you persist in unbelief and rebellion against God, it will end one way. It will end with the Lord of glory descending on the clouds, seeing you, judging you, condemning you in hell eternally forever where the smoke of your torment will rise day and night and you will have no rest. That's how it ends. Come out of that ending. Put your faith in Christ. He died for your sins so that God will forgive you, make you new in him, fill you with, your spirit, fill you with his spirit, 
and give you a glorious inheritance with him forever in the new heavens and the new earth. Stay in your unbelief and you fight constantly from a position of defeat and you go from defeat to defeat to ultimate consummate horrible defeat. Don't do that. Turn and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent of your sins and live. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for your power and the strength of your might. We thank you that you show us in your word how to lay hold of it. God, I pray, I, I, I'm pretty sure there's not a person in this room who is as strong in you as they would like to be. I know I'm not. So I pray for this year. I, I lift this congregation up to you, God, in, in my own soul. And I pray that by your power, you would grow us uh, in the word of God. Grow us in praying in the spirit. Grow us in meaningful connection uh, to the body of Christ. That we might walk in your strength, giving glory to you, seeing you do wonderful things. And when people look at our lives, there's only one conclusion. It's Jesus has risen from the dead. It's he loves his church. He died for him. He fills his church. He lives in his church. He works through his church. Oh man, Jesus Christ is glorious. I pray that would be the statement uh, over our lives uh, this year, Lord. And we pray for these things in Jesus' name. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.